How easy is it to shift the needle on public opinion about gender and sexuality? It's not easy, right? Especially in countries where there is still stigma and harsh laws around sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, and sex characteristics. We mostly hear about successful campaigns which have changed opinion around sexuality and gender taking place in North America and Western Europe. However, there are lots of others from countries as diverse as Poland, Costa Rica, Ukraine, Nepal, and Zimbabwe. I'm Temba, and I'm here to introduce you to a series of case studies in which activists share their stories about how and why they developed successful campaigns in challenging circumstances. Each case study is built around a specific challenge, such as working in contexts where prejudice is rooted in strong religious beliefs, or where traditional cultural norms and practices prohibit the expression of sexual orientation and gender identity, healing the wounds of homophobia and transphobia before being able to engage with a wider audience, and overcoming negativity and a lack of empathy for our issues by the wider public. Each case study provides insight into what worked and what didn't, and the lessons learnt along the way. The full report and stories are available to download here. Choose one that resonates with your situation or read them all to be inspired by other ingenious activists. Learn from others to build your own successful campaign. If you are an activist working on sexuality and gender issues, you're probably already aware of the importance of finding the right message and the right messenger for your campaign. Given the sensitive nature of this work, finding the right approach can seem like an impossible task, especially in conservative societies. A group of activists in Poland struggling against widespread prejudice deeply rooted in strong religious beliefs, achieved what many people thought was impossible. This is their story. A part of the journey to become a country with institutionalized civil, political and human rights, activists across Poland have initiated many campaigns around issues related to gender and sexuality. Campaign Against Homophobia has contributed to this work by running a number of successful campaigns promoting acceptance and equality for LGBT people. However, during all these campaigns, they had carefully avoided dealing with the institution that many saw as the main cause of narrow-mindedness and intolerance around sexuality and gender, the Catholic Church. Polish society is very conservative. Over 90% of people are practicing Catholics. Changing the mindset of the majority meant finding a way to engage persuasively with religious people. Aware of the negative reaction and hostility they could expect upon starting a dialogue with the church, Campaign Against Homophobia knew they needed a strategy. They would build new ways of working with people they knew would have a hard time hearing their messages. And so they sought allies, not only within the LGBT community, but also within the Christian community. Campaign Against Homophobia started off by building an alliance with Faith and Rainbow, an organization of practicing Christians who are working to reform the church's attitude towards sexuality and gender. Together they approached a PR agency to create a message that would resonate with both sides, the LGBT community with their different stances on religion and practicing Christians with mostly negative perceptions of the LGBT community. The message they chose was simple but clear. A handshake between an LGBT person and a Christian, representing the possibilities for finding common ground based on understanding and acceptance. Faith and Rainbow took the lead in connecting the campaign to their target audience. The traditional Catholic hierarchy was opposed to the campaign, but by not focusing on them and inevitably getting into a confrontational discussion, 
the campaign received a more positive response from lay Christians than anyone had expected. It showed that acceptance was more possible than many people had imagined. This was achieved through a simple insight. Just like there were religious people in the LGBT community, there were LGBT individuals within the Christian community. Now that it had been shown that people were not as distant from each other as it seemed, the groundwork has been laid for deeper dialogue and reconciliation. Does the situation in Poland remind you of your own country? Have you been looking for inspiration to engage with religious communities? Do you want to move beyond confrontation and frustrating dead-end dialogue in your advocacy work? Download the full report below if you want to learn more. G. In 2018, the Supreme Court of Costa Rica ruled that same-sex couples would be able to marry. Great, well done! So, why on earth did you launch a campaign after the victory? Hey Chico, do you think it's that simple? You get a law passed after a court decision and you think everybody will just say, okay, cool, yeah. The presidential election that took place just before the court ruling had been ugly. The issue of same-sex marriage literally divided the country and almost got a harsh conservative elected. It was a close shot. So, you mean you had to convince people that they should accept this court ruling? You've said it. Accept. We knew there were a lot of people out there who were not happy. Who were they? How did you know? But we did conduct some research. You know, without research, you really are just living on assumption, and that's a huge mistake. So we found out through research that men over the age of 40 were the hardest to convince. And how did you manage to talk to them? We made sure that the people who talked to this audience were people that they could relate to, identify with, and respect. So we had a team of rugby players, really nice traditional parents, understanding fathers, supporting people from the village. And what was that message that managed to convince these men? Still through research, we found out that some of the key common values for Costa Ricans are respect, justice, and family. So we showed a lot of accepting families where family love is stronger than stigma. Again, the core focus was on acceptance. So the campaign slogan naturally became, Yo si acepto, I do accept. We got some really beautiful videos made. I hope you watch them after our talk. They are really moving. And what about the opponents? How did you deal with them? Ah, uh, you know. Sometimes you have to just forget about them. Even if Jesus himself came down and told them to stop doubting, they still wouldn't listen. We tried to avoid them as much as we could. They are a waste of time. But sorry, Chico, it's getting late. I have to go. Why don't you read our full report on sojicampaigns.org or evos.org? Most often, when activists tackle discrimination, we only focus on a single issue, like racism or sexism, or homophobia, transphobia, ageism or ableism. This can be effective, but it also has some limitations. One limitation is that no one has just one social identity. Some people are women, some people are men. Some people express their gender in a way that doesn't fit into either box. Some people are ethnic minorities, some people are young, some old, some disabled, some queer. All of us are actually many of these identities, together. An intersectional approach deliberately seeks to integrate different social identities and forms of discrimination under a more inclusive message. Inside Ukraine is an organization working for lesbians and bisexual women, transgender, queer and intersex people. They have been looking at the intersections of social identities in Ukraine and seen the way in which racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism and many other forms of oppression of minority groups have similar causes and work in similar ways. So, rather than starting to campaign against homophobia or transphobia, 
Insight launched a striking visual poster campaign that graphically showed the kind of hate speech women, LGBT and gender non-conforming people and ethnic minorities experience every day. By tackling this three together, the effect was to show how sexism and misogyny, homophobia and transphobia, and racism are connected, and to invite people to have a similar stance towards all three. The campaign soon went viral. More than 20,000 users saw the images, and over 10,000 people read at least one article about the campaign. For Insight, the campaign demonstrated that by looking at the more general issue of stigma through an intersectional lens, many more people were engaged than if they had only focused on homophobia and transphobia. But this approach was not just a clever way to get anti-racist and anti-sexist people to embrace the fight against homophobia. By showing the connection and pointing to the root causes, this campaign built long-lasting connections and alliances between several social movements. Feminist and anti-racist movements were not only more receptive to the issue of homophobia, they saw that their struggles were understood in their communities as well. For most of us, the laws in our country by and large reflect the state of public opinion. When a good proportion of people support a more progressive vision, the laws gradually change to reflect this. This is why most activists engage in lobbying and campaigning. In some cases though, the law just won't move even when public opinion had changed. This happens when very conservative governments are in power, but in some beautiful rare cases, the law jumps ahead of public opinion and shows what progress looks like. This is what happened in Nepal, thanks to years of strategic and clever activism by the Blue Diamond Society, Nepal's leading organization working for gays, lesbians and third gender people, as Nepal traditionally calls transgender people. As a result, in 2015, Nepal became the world's 10th country to specifically name LGBT people as a protected category in its new constitution, and a third gender category now officially coexists with male and female gender markers. Obviously, this is a good reason to celebrate, but the fight is not over. While in Kathmandu, progressive people were increasingly supporting sexual and gender diversities, in other parts of the country, traditional circles were frowning upon these evolutions, seen as imported from the decadent West. Nepal had never been colonized, and it wasn't to start now. Opposition started to mount, like dark clouds coming in. But the Blue Diamond Society was not an agent of anyone. The diamond had been formed within Nepal's age-old mountains, hills, rivers, and people. So when the Blue Diamond Society decided to start pride marches in Nepal, it very naturally didn't turn towards New York or London for inspiration. It looked inward to Nepalese culture. The festival of Gaijatra is one of the oldest and most unusual of many festivals celebrated by the Hindus and Buddhists. Over the centuries, the festival developed a second purpose. In the days when political expression of any kind was outlawed, Gaijatra was the day when ordinary citizens could vent their frustrations through political and social satire without fear of reprisal from the rulers. Given this history, Gaijatra was the perfect time for a joyful protest march. Leading the march, riding on an elephant in rainbow colors, was just one of the many genius ideas that got the Pride March radically enshrined in local culture. Does that approach make sense to you? Do you feel you could get inspired? Read more about this in our special report. When it comes to affecting change, stories can be more powerful than facts and figures. This is a lesson from Zimbabwe, where a community-based organization called Roots use storytelling and dialogue to change attitudes towards reproductive health and rights and save women's lives. Zimbabwe is a highly religious society. 
Over three quarters of the population are Christian. Many people are socially conservative, especially when it comes to gender, sexuality, and marriage. Premarital sex is widely frowned upon, so it's difficult for young Zimbabweans to access contraception. Compounding this issue is the 1977 Termination of Pregnancy Act. This 40-year-old law prevents women from accessing an abortion outside of a very narrow set of circumstances. Because of the restrictions, 70,000 Zimbabwean women risk illegal abortions each year. Tragically, almost one in three of young women who die from abortion-related complications are only teenagers. Roots decided they had to do something about the situation. They knew the task ahead was huge. They would have to persuade politicians and policymakers to reform the Termination of Pregnancy Act, despite it having widespread public supports. To do this, they used the power of storytelling. They spoke to women who had experienced unsafe abortions and trained them as community champions. These champions tell their stories to religious leaders, community leaders, and elected assembly members in Zimbabwe's parliament. Many of these leaders have seen the statistics, but they only see numbers. They don't understand the human cost of the suffering until a real person looks them in the eye and tells them what they've been through. Ruth took an assembly member to a presentation by a community champion in a rural area. She heard firsthand about the impact that unsafe abortions were having in the community. At the end, she stood up and said, I'm a Christian and pro-life, but now I'm thinking differently. I didn't know that these are the challenges that the women are going through. I've been deeply moved by what I've heard. When one assembly member starts raising the issue of abortion rights, it has a ripple effect across all policymakers and the Zimbabwean public as a whole. After five years of this work, Roots has taken an issue that no one wanted to even acknowledge and ensured that women most affected by an outdated law are being heard at the highest levels of government about the need for change. Hey, are you okay? You look kind of sad. I wish I was braver. If I was, I would tell them to stop. What are you afraid of if you go talk to them? I don't know what to say. I'm scared that, that they will attack me instead. I, I, I just can't do it. But most of all, I'm scared that maybe they're right. Maybe who I am is not okay. Maybe I don't deserve to be treated better. Being different can be hard, especially when the only message you get is that you're not okay. That's not what I see. What I see is someone brave and beautiful. But it doesn't matter what I see. What matters is how you feel. Positive Vibes is a leading queer African rights-based development organization. For many years, they have been working intensively with community activists to better understand their experience of being othered and to help heal the wounds of living in deeply prejudiced and unequal societies. They have found that this kind of work is an essential first step to enabling people to find their voice and unite to build organizations to fight for social justice and human rights. To find out more about how Positive Vibes do this work in partnership with organizations around Africa and Asia, download the full case study and report.